All right, welcome back, folks, to another episode of the 100% Wild Podcast. I'm Mark Kenyon over here with Wired to Hunt. On the other side of the internet, we got Matt and Tim with Drury Outdoors. How are you, gentlemen? Good, buddy. Hey, How are you? I'm doing good. A little bit um, mixed emotions today because I'm excited to be here, but I am a little bit bummed yeah. uh, because this is my last episode with you guys on the podcast. <sighs> It has been a good, good ride, but um, like we talked about last time, I'm going to be handing the reins over to you, Tim, to uh, to, to keep Matt in line. Yeah, so. you haven't left yet, and stuff is already falling apart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we need you to stay. <laughs> you took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> We're on the same page. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm bummed as well, but, you know, I'm excited for you and, and what you guys have uh, planned in your future. It sounds really exciting, and, and we're fans. We're fanboys yeah. anyways. That's kind of how this whole partnership got rolling to begin with. So I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys come out with with uh, your next endeavor. And, uh, of course, on our end, I'm, I'm excited, kind of nervous. Uh, we gotta, <laughs> you too. Yeah, yeah. We, we got we to gotta walk on our own now. So no more crawling along with somebody holding their hand and showing us the way. I think you guys, you guys have got it well figured out. You're going to be just fine. And um, I guess with that said, uh, Tim, do you want to share any updates as far as logistics with the podcast or any kind of housekeeping stuff before we get into the actual content today? Yeah. So this is kind of like a, like a baton handoff in a race that we're not losing mm -hmm. any momentum. The, the show is going to continue on, but there is a little trick that you have to pay attention to. So if you want to continue to listen to the show, you'll have to go on and subscribe to a new feed. And the show, we got really creative about this and we called it Drury Outdoors 100% Wild Podcast. It was a long meeting. It took us a long time <laughs> to figure out a name. But, yes. <laughs> but we got it. So the difference is the, the show you're listening to right now is called 100% Wild Podcast. The new show is Drury Outdoors 100% Wild Podcast. So you'll need to go subscribe to that now to ensure that you get the next episode because this is the last one that we're kind of sharing together. On Mark's current network. Exactly. Yeah. And, and so you can go to our website, DruryOutdoors.com slash podcast, right. and it'll take you to the links for, you know, for Stitcher and, and iTunes and Google, Google Play. Play. And, yep. and then also um, we can still do that. We have SpeakPipe there on that, that web page where you can still submit your questions. Uh, we're going to continue on with that format um, that Mark's been generous enough to mm -hmm. kind of allow us to like you said take the baton and, and run with it so you know i bigger more than anything i just want to say thank you to mark and yeah, his absolutely. audience because um you know I, they have been a great help mm -hmm. and and very kind to us and helping us establish the first you know 60 70 podcasts that we've done in association with mark so um you know i'm hopeful that we can continue to um have their trust and mm -hmm. lis listenership and, and they kind of go over and, and subscribe to the new podcast. And, you know, we'll, we'll continue to have interesting guests and, and, and new topics to cover. And we're going to try to start, you know, now that we got everything up and running, start mm -hmm. hitting this thing weekly again and, yeah. and get back to where we have a certain flow and especially ramping up into the season. So um, again, just want to say thanks to the listeners that, that Mark and his audience kind of brought to the table. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and to your earlier point, um, we definitely are still going to be doing some things together. I think any way we can find to partner together, Drury Outdoors and Wired to Hunt and the three of us, and like I've said before, I would love to still come on as a guest or guest co-host again on the show. I mean, this is definitely something that I think there'll be plenty of fun things still in our futures together. Um, but, you know, new projects, doing some different yeah. things, that's always exciting too. Um, I guess I'll, I'll throw out one more kind of, logistics thing too if you're listening to this on the Drury YouTube channel and you still want to follow what I've got going on I still have my regular wired to hunt podcast which you can subscribe to and listen to weekly as well um, in addition to what you guys will be doing with the Drury outdoors 100% wild podcast which I know is going to be awesome too so I don't I don't want to um, drag this on any longer than it has to but is there anything else we need to cover there or should we start talking about deer and uh, the fun stuff that we're excited about this time of year yeah i think just one last thing to clarify so the current 100 percent podcast that your listeners are subscribed to what will happen to that going forward i think it's is it just kind of in limbo for a little bit you might uh it used to have a different name so you might pick back up on that later so they might still want to keep subscribing to it 
Yep, yep. So that's going to go into kind of uh, limbo status for a while. In the future, there might be, like you mentioned, maybe we'll go back to the old podcast that it was before, Whitetail Q&A or something like that. Far, far down the line, we'll see. Um, so yeah, I'd say just kind of stash that away in, in the back of your podcast app for the future. And for now, Wired to Hunt podcast for what I'm doing, Jury Outdoors 100% Wild podcast for what you're doing, and um, we'll see what happens. All right, yeah. I think that covers it. Well, and just just one one more thing, <laughs> when when folks subscribe to the new show, Drew Outdoors One Hundred Percent Wild Podcast, they immediately have access to the back catalog of every show that we've done together. So that's almost seventy shows. So you, so you don't lose anything by by subscribing to the new show. Sure, good point. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, excellent point. Awesome. Well. Uh, now that we've got that out of the way. I think everyone ever it's pretty simple, so everyone can go over and make those quick changes. We still do have one show to handle though today, so we got to make this a good one, Matt and Tim. The pressure's high since this is like our, this is like the climax of oh, wow. the Wired Hunt and Jury Outdoors 100% Wild Podcast. So never, we have to go out on top here. Never done well with that kind of pressure, <laughs> right? Yeah, this is gonna go down in flames. Let's do it. <laughs> well, you we get, have a you, we have a listener question today okay. that's that's about a topic that we've talked about a lot um, in the past. But I think today, because of who the question is coming from, the type of person the question is coming from, I think it's an opportunity to maybe take this topic from the ground up. Lots of times we approach it in little pieces and parts, and, and I'll, I'll just tell you, it's trail cameras. But I think today we can have an opportunity to present trail cameras and talk about trail cameras at a foundational level and kind of explore the whole topic because this is a beginner that we're going to be taking a question from. So uh, if you're up for it, guys, I think we can jump right to that question. Let's do it. The question of the day is brought to you by Cabela's, the world's foremost outfitter. Hi, my name is Joe, and I'm from Parkersburg, West Virginia. This will be my second year of bow hunting. My question is about trail cameras. This will be my first year using them, and I'm curious how often you check yours if you use any scent control when placing and checking them, should I be worried about the impact I am making when placing and checking them? I'm setting them out this month. Thank you. Joe's the king of enunciating. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Very clear. Do you do you guys want to take a stab at the specific start to his question there when it came, when it came to how often should you check them? Should we use scent control? And then how, or yeah, I think those are the two big things he mentioned. And then, you know, we can then maybe expand from there too. Because I think, like I said, I think since he's a beginner, since it's the first time he's used trail cameras, there's a lot, there's a lot we could share as far as, you know, helping set him up for success with cameras this year. Yeah, for sure. I think, you know, the biggest thing, and I actually just put out a camera and it's a little early for me right now. It's June 20th. I put out a camera last Thursday, which is not typical. I usually don't go that early, mm-hmm. but we were on the farm. We were doing work kind of, um, uh, cutting out a new food plot, getting ready for uh, late August when we plant it. And, and Matt, why don't you go that early? Typically? Well, honestly, like, I mean, some guys you leave their, their cameras out all, all year. I know mm-hmm. dad, dad's one of them, but, um, I, I don't really care to get the pictures of a deer and the beginning of you sure. know his growing stages, I I'd rather wait till after July Fourth, and, and we're cl- we're getting close to that. Mm-hmm. But I'd I'd rather wait till after July Fourth to put out my cameras, and then basically that last month of of you know late July through August, they are what they are. You know be, what yeah. they are. Now that's that's you know that doesn't help you with inventory or other you know other reasons why you might want to put your cameras mm-hmm. out earlier. But um, you know I I just. To, to go back to the point, you know, how much do you want to uh, minimize your uh, footprint out there early season or, or, you know, in the summer here like this, I don't really utilize a ton of scent control, but mm-hmm. you know, I know like guys like Mark, I mean, he won't go in there unless the wind's right and, and all sure. that stuff. He's probably a little more relaxed about it 
in the summertime, Mm -hmm. but you know, the the closer you get to the hunting season, he just, he's not going to a camera unless it's the right wind, meaning the wind's not blowing into bedding or where the deer might be coming from. Uh, but yeah, for me, I'll start putting out my cameras in, in early to mid July. Um, I'm in a County in Missouri where you can still use mineral and Mm -hmm. feed and all that stuff. And so to help me get that inventory, I'll, I'll put out some analogics or what, you know, some mineral dirt or whatever the case may be. And, Mm -hmm. and, and I'll try to get as many pictures of, of, hopefully as many deer as I can yeah. in a short amount of time. As far as when I go back in to check the cameras, I, I try not to do that very often either. I mean, the, in the closer we get to the season, I know Mark, this is your kind of philosophy as well. It, it, it becomes even less and less and less. I go less because I just don't want to be in there. Right. And, you know, I, I've talked about it on the podcast many times. I think last year, just because of the amount of work we did on the lease, uh, late into the summer, I think it was a real detriment because I was in there a lot more than sure. I, than I had been in the years previous. So, um, yeah, I mean, I kind of feel like my philosophy, it, it has changed the, the more experience I've gained mm-hmm. and less is more is kind of yeah. the best way to look at it. Yeah. yeah. Agreed. Mark, what do you think? Yeah, I'm right there with you, Matt. Um, I would say as far as his summer trail camera work right now that he's starting, to your point, um, I would be checking them as, as, as rarely as you can possibly handle. I know when I first started using trail cameras, I was so excited about it, and it was so much fun to check them. <laughs> that, that Yeah, it was like I was checking every three days. I was like, i got to <laughs> see what the pictures there might be. And that is, uh, that's self-defeating. You're not going to help yourself by going in there that often. So now for my summer pictures, uh, at least on the farms where I live kind of close to them and I, that I can go check them often, I, I force myself to wait a minimum of two weeks. Mm-hmm. And now I'm even trying to get <clears throat> to the point where it's three to four weeks because I'm not doing anything with that data right now. You know, if, if I get a picture of a buck on July 15th, it's not going to hurt me to not know about it until August 15th. Mm-hmm. The only thing I'm going to do by waiting longer is just improve the chances of getting more high quality pictures mm-hmm. during the summer. So Every time you're going in there, you are reducing your chances of getting good pictures. And lots of times, at least here in Michigan, every time I go in and check a camera, it takes four to seven days until I start getting mature bucks on camera again. Mm-hmm. Usually just that one intrusion will really knock down the sightings for, for a good number of days. So, so yeah, now when it comes to summer pictures, I'm, I'm letting them sit as long as I possibly can. Now, when you fast forward to hunting season, like you mentioned, Matt, that does increase a little bit because now there's the desire. Well, let me take that back. It depends. It increases only if I can get to these cameras in a really safe way or if I'm already passing by them to go hunt places. That's when it might increase. Otherwise, again, to your point, we're trying to be as careful and low intrusion as we possibly can because now while you do want recent information, to help inform your future hunts at the same time you also can make a significant negative impact if you're in there checking them at the wrong times or too often that actually is going to impact your hunting um so to that point about the impact you're making i do practice a decent amount of scent control in the summer not as much um what i do during the summer and and every time i check a camera is i do wear gloves when touching the camera I do spray it down afterwards with some kind of you know scent eliminating spray and then i usually put a little jolt of nose jammer just underneath it too. I don't know how much that helps, but I just figure it's one more little thing that maybe will keep them from smelling any kind of human odor on the camera or around it. So I do that every time I check a camera, every time I set up a camera, anything like that. And then I am being careful about where my wind's blowing. And whenever I can, I'm using like my ATV to drive up to it or a truck to drive up to it. Um, and if not, you know, I'm, I'm just being careful not to go trudging into bedding areas or something even more so during the hunting season. Um, so I guess as far as scent control and how often to check them, that would be my high level thoughts. Uh, before we dive into any other aspects though, Tim, would you add anything to those two? Yeah, definitely. So first off, Joe, welcome to the bow hunting community. I'm always excited when folks, especially as adults get into bow hunting because it's, it's you know rare. It, it, it is rare and it's a little intimidating and so thank you Joe for your question thanks for reaching out uh, welcome we're we're awful glad to have you um, so and and I think that as you find with any uh, any interest or any pursuit that you get more and more into you find that there are 
less clear cut answers and a lot of well that depends type of answers and and i think trail cam placement and and accessing trail cams is a great that depends because there are some places on a cattle ranch that i hunt that the property owner buzzes up and down these fence lines with with his atv and and deer are used to intrusions there, so it's not that big of a deal for them to see human activity or catch the whiff of, 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 of a human on those places. There are other places, however, where I won't hunt. They're kind of refuges until the rut hits, and I may put a camera back there in July and not touch that camera again until October when I'm going in with my climber on my back, checking the camera, and then making the decision right there in the moment where I'm going to set my stand. So a lot of it depends on what type of activity is happening in the area. And then as far as trail camera placement goes, I like to think about that in terms of where would I hunt? And when I think about where I hunt, I think about wind direction and direction that the deer are coming. Um, because then I'll probably hang a stand near where that trail, and I know there are different philosophies on where you hang your stand versus where you hang your camera, but I like to try to get as close as possible to both of those being lined up. Yeah, that's a good point. And the the camera I hung uh, last Thursday, it, two things worked to our advantage. One, one we were kind of clearing that area, but it is an area where I plan on hanging a stand, you know, here in the next week or two. And the other thing, uh, a front, and this just was pure luck, a front, a huge front came up, um, off the Mississippi and rolled through and it washed away. I mean, it was a, it was a downpour. Yeah. So kind of washed away or sent, and, and, you know, like I said, it just timed out that way and it was kind of a lucky coincidence, but that's a good point too, because honestly, if, if you can time it out to where you have a rain after you put your cameras out, it does kind of do you a favor right. and help. Um, you know, I don't know that it totally gets, get, gets your scent and, and kind of your in, intrusion out, but it certainly helps it uh, go away quicker. So, um, it just was a lot, kind of a lucky happenstance type yeah. of a So deal. wash your car and then go hang up your trail <laughs> <camera> <laughs> yeah. and then it'll rain. That's right. <laughs> uh, on that topic of placement, maybe we can talk a little bit more about that, you know, where our favorite places are to put cameras in the summer versus where we tend to put our cameras during the hunting season. Um, very quickly, when it comes to summertime, I'm placing my cameras as close as possible to high-quality summer food sources as possible usually. Um, so like a soybean field is a great example of that, um, if, especially if you're in a state where you're not allowed to use mineral or bait or anything like that to get those pictures – um, you know, putting them on a bean field or an alfalfa field or clover field or something like that, or a water hole, anything that's going to attract deer during that time of year, that's going to be a good bet for summer pictures. Fast forward to hunting season though. Usually I, I shift my cameras once you get to that velvet peel time period. So September, that first week of September, lots of times bucks are losing their velvet and there's this shift in behavior. There's a shift in home range in many cases for bucks. And we begin to see different types of um, – we start seeing deer showing up in different types of places. So usually at that time period, I shift most of my cameras to my hunting season spots where then I keep them for most of the hunting season unless there's one-off cases where I'm adjusting. Typically, those hunting season locations are – on scrapes, I put a lot of trail cameras on either real scrapes that tend to come back year after year or on mock scrapes that I've created myself or like a fake scrape tree that I put out in the middle of a field because and this is something we've talked about a lot in the past, but bucks check these scrapes. It, it's, it's, it's a hub of communication. So you're going to get a disproportionate amount of activity at these locations because bucks are coming, all sorts of deer are coming to these scrapes to smell them, to leave their own sign, check out what's going on. And a lot of these pictures might be at night especially if these are field edge scrapes, but it's a great way to just get inventory of what bucks are in the area. Is the deer I'm hunting still around here? How often is he showing up? And you can start to infer some stuff based mm -hmm. off of those pictures, even if they are daylight or sorry, not daylight pictures. Um, I also like to try to keep most of my cameras during the hunting season in locations that I can easily access. So to my, it's kind of the same point I made during the summer. If I can drive up to it on an ATV or a truck, or if it's going to be an interior location, it's got to be somewhere that I'm going to be passing by to hunt. And I'm not going to go check in that camera unless I'm passing by already. Um, that way, again, just trying to keep that intrusion low. Um, 
So other than those scrape locations, sometimes they'll place cameras on like a, a popular creek crossing or if there's any kind of funnel or pinch point or a down fence or something like that. Anything that funnels deer movement where you're going to get a little bit extra activity in this one specific location, that's going to be a good place to put a camera. And if you can think through, you know, how can a picture at this spot help my hunting strategy? And, and think about that. So whether maybe you want to put a camera right where you're going to hunt, like you're talking about, Tim, um, there's there's value in that. There's also risk in that. Um, so you just have to be careful about, you know, how you place your camera, what kind of camera you use, different things like that. Because the, the, the fear in that is that some people believe that deer will become camera shy. So if they have a bad experience with the camera, like maybe a bright flash camera goes off in their face, if a mature buck sees that and smells maybe some human odor on it, that might spook him out of that area and he'll never come through there during daylight again. Um, so that's that's one side of that argument. Um, so if you're going to put them near cameras, I would just say be, be particularly, if you're gonna put them by your tree stands, sorry, I'd say just be particularly careful. Um, but otherwise, if you're going to put them elsewhere, just be thinking about what can I use this information for? So lots of cases, I'll be placing cameras, like I said, near food sources, but tight to bedding areas. And then once you start to see, you know, a buck passing by maybe an hour before dark, and then it's half hour before dark, or sorry, after dark, and then it's 15 minutes after dark. Now you're knowing that, that you're getting closer and closer to that time frame when maybe this buck's going to come out into the open where you might be able to get a shot at him. So that kind of stuff can just help add some data points to your tool chest of when you want to hunt this spot or when these bucks are going to become daylight active and it's worth hunting your farm. Um, just be thinking through those types of things. That's that's kind of trail camera placement at a very high level for me. Um, I do try to, at least I'm trying to do more of this. I used to put cameras right at eye level you know, right next to where these deer are going to pass by. I'm trying to do a better job of being careful about that and putting cameras higher up in a tree and angled down just to try to account for the potential of spooking deer, you know, trying to minimize that. Um, I've had some in some cases where I've had mature bucks that don't seem to be bothered at all, at all by trail cameras. I've had other situations where I'll get one or two pictures of a buck and it looks like he's looking right at the camera and then I never get him there again. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure what kind of, um, influence or impact they do have but i'm trying to find ways to minimize it i think that has more to do with the camera itself mo most likely i maybe not always but like you said if there is a white flash you know like we we don't use many white flash mm -hmm. uh, trail cameras anymore at, at least we don't because i i do think that has a negative ef effect you know some people will swear by them and say, say that doesn't bother them at all but you know if you can get an infrared uh camera i think that'll certainly help your cause yep. Um, just in general, you know, if this is his first year putting out a camera, um, you know, he, he's going to have to go buy, you know, he's going to have to go buy cameras. So one thing we didn't talk about is, um, you know, a lot of, I think a lot of guys might make the mistake of getting something that's on sale or something that's, hmm. you know, cheap, affordable. Yeah. And all the, although I understand that you're, it's your hard earned money, you're going out there and you, you got to invest in this thing and it, it may or may not get stolen. I mean, there's a lot mm -hmm. of pros yeah. and cons to it. I do think that you probably want to find a camera that's in the mid, you know, price point range at the very least, because it, it I just know the ins and outs of our business. I, I know return rates for cameras and a lot of times mm -hmm. those ones that are very affordable have a very high return rate. Yeah. And, uh, so you get kind of, it's one of those deals where you get what you pay for. Um, that being said, you know, there's a lot of good cameras out there in the market too. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of good camera companies. And and the other thing you might want to look into is a uh, is a text camera. Those are, are becoming very popular now, and a lot of guys swear by them. And you talk about intrusion. Hell, hell there is no. You know, there's little to no intrusion when right, you have yeah. a text camera because yeah. there's no need for you to to go in there a to check if it's batteries are uh, still you know good or mm -hmm. if somebody stole it or you know that that unknown of of just kind of wondering what happened with what's going right. on with your camera if you got a text camera you you really kind of know what's going on with it so that's a you know just kind of going through pros and cons of of the camera landscape because there are a ton of options out there mm -hmm. um and, and and there's a lot of good cameras out there really are yep. so yeah and we could probably spend a whole episode on what makes a good trail camp yeah. for a particular scenario but w one thing that i kind of learned the hard way is that are that megapixels are not the end-all be-all mm -hmm. when it comes to image quality from a trail camera so 
as much as possible, look online for examples of images from the trail cams and see what they're pumping out as opposed to just going by what's on the package. Because you might you might find a cheap one. Here's the kind of another drawback of a cheap one. You might find a good uh, cheap one that, you know, hey, it, it's serviceable, it works, but, like, what's the quality of the photo, too? Mm-hmm. You know, and you, there is a difference. And if, you get, if you're getting nighttime photos and maybe they're a little bit further out, hell you're sp- gonna spend more time wondering what that deer was <laughs> Was that a yeti or was that <laughs> yeah. a buck or- <laughs> so i mean there's just things you got to think through and and um you know i think there's so much information out there online that you can check you mm-hmm. know user experiences for all different types yeah. of cameras i would just do a little bit of homework and google it you know if you found one that you liked online google what the feedback is mm-hmm. from co- the consumer themselves so uh, before yeah. you make your purchase decision yeah that's a great point. And I, and I agree with you, Matt, about the the price versus quality. And I tend to try to find that middle ground, too, because if you go too far to the affordable side, the very, very, very affordable, I agree. They end up, in many cases, at least the ones I tried in the past, end up being junk. And you end up having to buy many, many of them because you're constantly replacing them or returning them. So it seems to be, like you said, you get what you pay for there. Um, <clears throat> would you guys add anything else when it comes to favorite places to place them? Um, whether it be summertime or during hunting season, any other specific areas or setups that we haven't touched on? Well, you, you know, you, you more or less have, have touched on the good, the good areas to put them, but the, the time to transition is also important. Like mm-hmm. when to transition, you know, from a, from a food source to a scrape, you know, the, the mid October to, yeah. towards late October time time span there where they're going to be hitting those scrapes and they're starting to kind of get frisky and get jiggy with it and putting their, you know, they're wanting to <laughs> find out. Term. Yeah. They're wanting to find <laughs> out, you know, get, get their scent out there and yeah. let all the ladies know they're in the area and kind of tell all the other bucks they're in the area. So, you know, you, you pointed it out already, but if you have a, like a hub scrape or some big area or even a rub, you know, that that's like, wow, this, where this rub come mm-hmm. from, I, I mean, you got to be able to be adaptive around those periods too. Yeah. And if you only got one cam, it's it's a lot more difficult if you only have one camera. Obviously, uh, if you have the you know the fortune of having two or three, you have the ability to kind of um, pinpoint your area and decide. Okay, mm-hmm. I tri- triangulate where that deer may be. If you only got one area to hang. Uh, you just can't go wrong putting it on a big scrape yeah. going into the rut. Something's going to come back. Something's going to hit it, mm-hmm. you know? So you, you, you more or less, it's almost like in the summertime in those areas where you can put a mineral or something like that, you'll get almost every deer, you know, mm-hmm. cause they're just, they're just coming to it. It, the, a scrape during that late, you know, October, early November time period is almost like the, as good as the, the same thing. You know, yeah. it's like every deer will come to that thing. Any anybody in the hierarchy of what you want to hunt, that's mm-hmm. that's somebody you want to know as far as the deer goes, he'll hit it. Yeah. So that's that's the only other you know feedback I'd have. But you got to be able to think on your feet and transition when it's time to transition. Yeah, and, and you also think about someone that's new to bow hunting and that that. Uh, inevitable disappointment that comes when you've got great trail cam picks of bachelor groups with great bucks in them all summer long and then September comes and hunting season rolls around and they're gone because they've totally changed and we talked about that a lot before but Joe just so you know that things will change so the summer patterns that you see on your trail cams now will be different once time uh, once the the time comes to hunt those deer more than likely their home ranges change I mean your your herd might not even be the same Mm -hmm. you know what I mean like you just got to be ready for that um you also got to be ready for a thousand raccoon pictures a billion doe and fawn <laughs> yes. pictures and uh, you, like you'll spend hours not wasted time but you will spend hours just looking click 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 picture to picture and uh and, and but the one time you know big daddy comes rolling through there your, you know, your eyes light yep. up and it's like, oh, oh, oh I got to <laughs> take a picture of this. I got to send it to somebody. It, yes. it happened. I have a deer that I want to hunt. Absolutely. So it, that's what makes it all worth it. That is a great feeling. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I wonder if we should talk a little bit about our favorite settings or anything like that on cameras. Um, yeah. cause that might be something that a beginner trail camera user might wonder. Cause there are a lot of different ways to customize, you know, the different, options for your camera when you're putting it out there at first and and each different trail camera model is going to have a different set of options available um but i'll just touch on a couple basic ones that i tend to like to use um i don't use a video mode 
on my cameras, but actually this year I want to try it more often because I think there is a lot of value in it and I see a lot of guys using it um, in a good way. So I haven't done that yet, but it's something I want to experiment with. I've always been worried about um, it sucking battery life in, in card space. <laughs> and then, and then yeah, because I'm trying to be very careful about not checking it too often, I've always been worried about you know it not being kind of having the longevity I need, but maybe I can try that in places I can get to with a vehicle or something. But, uh, but so otherwise what I've always done in the past is I've always set it on regular photo mode. Even when I have a camera that has a high pixel rating, I usually don't use the highest pixel rating available. I usually go kind of whatever the middle option is again, because I'm trying to preserve as much SD card space and battery life as possible. Um, I usually go with a three burst mode. So every time that camera triggers, if something passes by, it's going to take three pictures run after the other so that, you know, if there's a deer walking through or, you know, the buck comes to a scraper or, or whatever it might be, you've got a chance to get several pictures of that one experience. Um, and then usually you can place, a, uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? There's a time period that it will stop taking delay. pictures before it triggers again. Yeah, the the delay. delay. Yeah. Um, so for me, what I usually do is if, if I put this on, like if it's a mineral or something in the summer, I'm going to do a longer delay. Because if you don't, you could just get the same picture of a doe and fawn on there just over and over and over for an hour or two. Um, so I usually try to do like a one minute delay, two or three picture burst for those summer pictures on if it's a bait site or something. And then during the season, though, when it's just a buck that's passing by on a trail or hitting a scrape or something, then I know these deer aren't going to be staying for very long. Um, so I don't need to worry about that, but I do want to capture, you know, any multiple deer that might be coming through there. So in that case, it's the three shot burst and then a much shorter delay, you know, 20 to 30 seconds, maybe 15 to 30 seconds. One of those options there. Um, I think those are like the, the high level things I usually do. I haven't used, um, time-lapse mode too often either, but that's something I, I should probably experiment with more. I know some cameras have that. Yeah. A lot of people's like using, like using that on food plots, um, what, what, what else do you guys think? What would you uh, recommend as far as settings? That, that's exactly right. I actually do use time-lapse mode quite a bit. I know Mark doesn't use it often. I think he actually uses it during the spring for like turkeys sure. on food plots or whatever, or like an area they just burn. But I, I actually do use it quite a bit once the season gets rolling and I got it over a, a food plot that's just a big, vast area where I just can't pinpoint them on where they're traveling. Mm -hmm. I'll just hit it for the – so it depends on the time of year – but, um, you know, if it's the right time of year, maybe say like during the rut, I might have the first hour of the morning and the mm -hmm. last hour in the evening or the, you know, when they're moving, basically sure. it's that, that's that I'll set it for an hour for both those times. And time-lapse mode can be brutal to run through if your camera's been yeah. out for yeah. three weeks or four weeks in time-lapse mode twice a day. I mean, it's, <sighs> it can be brutal cause it, it, it'll take it like every five well you could set these settings too or at least on the cameras i'm using i think it's a minute and five minutes like you can change mm -hmm. how often the time lapse yeah. actually takes but um i'll say this like i've caught a lot of deer a lot of my hit listers on time lapse mode on food plots that i would have never gotten right. they just yeah. don't go whether i got the camera in the wrong spot or whatever where they wouldn't have gone and triggered the camera because they weren't close mm -hmm. enough where they're at the back of the food plot you know against the timber and Th those types of things where I, you know, I catch a glimpse of him and it's like, oh right. man, he did hit this. He was coming mm -hmm. through here at the right time. So that's one thing. Another thing I wanted to mention about batteries, Energizer lithium batteries mm -hmm. will save your butt. I'm telling you, the, these, they're here too. You get what you pay for, but you will get a lot more life out of your camera if you're using an Energizer lithium battery. I, I'm, th th I, they just they go forever they really do especially so, in cold weather in cold weather they hold up so one of the other things anytime that i've had an issue with um running through batteries quick because typically speaking say i put a whole brand new set of energizer lithiums in at the beginning of the season so like so july you know that should last me on a regular camera through the entire season no mm -hmm. problem when it doesn't, it's because I have a setting wrong, I'm taking too many pictures, or I'm in video mode where I, I should have had a longer delay. Like video mode will suck yep. your battery life down big time. So you just got to watch it. You already mentioned this, Mark, but like that's something you really got to be careful for because video mode is great, but what I've noticed is a lot of times um, 
like early season, like right now, I, I try not to. I, I'm kind of over putting it on video mode right. because, like, I, on a mineral site or whatever, I'm just getting way too many, right. even with a delay. And it's a squirrel, it's a coon, it's, it's not a, helpful. It, it's not helpful. You know, it's great when you get a big buck walking through. Yeah. It just, you kind of got to say, all right, does it outweigh the risk of the batteries yeah. dying? And, mm -hmm. and I had two weeks where I had no pictures, no video because Great. it died on me. Yeah. And you only find that stuff out after the fact. So I don't know. I'm, I've been a little more cautious about that. But most cameras, I think, have feeder settings, scrape setting, um, uh, trail settings, like a preset that you know, the manufacturer determined, okay, here's how many pictures and this is how long the delay should be. Um, so it, it, when in doubt, use that, use mm -hmm. one of those settings that yeah. makes sense. Like I just put mine on feeder what that I put out on this mineral site. Cause more or less, it's kind of like the same thing at this mineral site will mm -hmm. more or less act like a feeder. I hope a lot of deer will come to it very often. I don't want a ton of pictures of that. Uh, so, you know, the delay period in there, but, um, you, you want to be pretty high. So that's kind of my two cents on it. If you run video mode, be extremely cautious of, of your settings and your dur duration. Like if there's a setting to have 15 seconds instead of 30, mm -hmm. you might want to go for that one. Yep. You know, that just the delay period, you might want to kick up to a couple minutes or five minutes or, you know, you might miss something, but it's worth it to keep the camera out there. Cause inevitably you, to your point, Mark, you get, two weeks here in July that I don't really care about. And then the two weeks in August that I didn't need to know where they were going, I don't have. So I've learned it the hard way the last couple of seasons, but I'm, I'm finally kind of figuring it out. Sure. Sure. And, and there's some things I think that are worth the, the investment of time to do that make your life easier in the long run. So, uh, so I'm, I'm a big time lapser, um, partially because of the, one of the properties I hunt is a cattle ranch. And so there's big wide open spaces and I want to be able to figure out where deer are moving that are way out of range that I wouldn't necessarily get with. So, uh, what I like to do is I bring the laptop with me when I go check the trail cameras and I'll spool all those photos off onto the hard drive as opposed to reading them from the SD card. They just seem to load faster. So in preview oh, yeah. mode, I can just skip right through, yeah. and I'm just looking for differences on the screen, and then I can stop and, yep. and, and look. So it's an easier way of getting through a bulk of, of images. The other thing is um, I've been tempted in the past, and I've done this before. I've not set the time and the date for the date, the, the time and date stamp on my cameras. On and purpose? Well, just because I was too busy, I was like, I'll just, I'll, it's on, the batteries are good, I'll just throw it up. You're going to want to set the date and time. Yeah, because <laughs> cause then you're like, oh gosh, like, was this was this <laughs> five o'clock in the afternoon or was this three? You're know, you looking the at data shadows. The data is useless and, otherwise. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 and, you know, as you're changing batteries, you might need to change the, uh, update the, the internal clock. So take the time to do that. It's important. You don't want to be guessing about when those deer came through. Uh, that's another good point about when the time changes in the fall. Yeah, yeah. You, 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 you know, if it's a camera you can easily get to, you should change your camera's time. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. that, you know, I just find myself when I don't trying to think back, okay, when was this picture taken? All right, when did the it's time change? Work. All right, yeah. but, you know, so that's one thing that you really want to be careful of. And then you mentioned SD cards. Um, so, like, Mark, you know, he – this this is crazy to me. Mark Jury, he'll have like a two gig or a four gig card. And he must check his cameras often enough or have the settings to, on a big enough delay. Mm -hmm. I don't know how he gets by with this, but like I'm sticking 32 gig cards yeah, in there because like eight, they're so cheap. I'd rather just be careful and right. be sure yeah. that I'm not going to run out of space. I've, if I, when I've gone time-lapse mode or video mode, there has been a few times where I run out of space. Mm -hmm. But by and large, if you're on picture mode and you got even an eight gig can, uh, card or four gig card, you are, you should Go not be quick. running out of yeah. space unless you just are leaving that camera for, you know, a month and a half or mm -hmm. two months. And it's a highly, you know, covered area. Right. Right. And, and, and you also want to be careful about what is in front of the camera. So if there are weeds yeah. Yeah. or if there are overhanging tree branches, you want to make sure the sensitivity is set correctly. And you want to make sure there's nothing that's because I've gotten like thousands of pictures of a milkweed yeah. dancing with the wind. That's not it's the worst. It's the worst. <laughs> it is. Yes. So we're giving Joe an overload here, but <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Again, there's no simple, there's no simple answers. There's, there's a lot to dig into. You but. asked for it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Not our fault. Um, so I want to add two things that are top of my mind here. First off, if there's anybody listening to this podcast that works for a trail camera company, here's a great new product idea. 
you got to get someone over at Reconyx to work on this map. All right. There's got to be some kind of way to use AI, some kind of automated um, way for a trail camera to scan yeah. whatever has triggered it and to determine whether or not it has, you know, if it, the, the, the characteristics of a buck or something. So you can have a different photo setting or trail camera yeah. setting for a buck versus something else. So somehow if it could determine, okay, yes, this is a buck, then it triggers video mode or then it triggers like a higher rate of burst mode or yeah. something like that. We've versus talked to other him about triggers. it. We've talked to him about it. It's, it's, yeah. I think it exists. It's not perfected. It's yeah, not, yeah. you know, I think probably multiple companies can, could put it out there. I just don't know how um, reliable it is just yet. I guarantee you something like that's coming though. Guarantee you. Mm, yeah. The, the technology now can do just about anything. Yeah. That would be, that would be super helpful. Game changer. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the second thing I would add is just something to keep in mind for what you do with those pictures afterwards. Because I think early on, what I used to do is I'd check all these pictures and I'd say, oh, great, I got a big buck and I'd show it to a friend or something. But then I would lose track of it or I'd dump it onto my hard drive somewhere, but I didn't have a good way of organizing it. And then I was never able to really you know, go back and use that data in any kind of really informed way in the future. So much of how I use trial cameras now is looking at data from past years. So looking at pictures from past years and then learning things from those patterns and then applying that to the future season. So this is something that, you know, Mark and Terry talk about a lot and, and a lot of what I've what I do now comes from learning from them and some other folks. So I try to make sure I'm saving at least what I do. People have different ways of going about this. But what I do is when I'm checking a trail camera, I have a folder open for each different property I hunt. And so if I'm, I'm checking a bunch of cameras from property X, I've got a folder for that for mature bucks. And then I keep pictures of any two year old or older buck I save because that's basically when they get to the point where they're recognizable. Usually if you see a two year old, you'll know what he's going to look like and you can kind of follow him as a three, four or five year old, whatever. So I save any picture I get of a two year old buck or older into this mature buck folder for that property. And then what I'm able to do then in future years is I can go back and look at that folder and then I can see, you know, it's, it's ordered in chronological order. And then I can scroll through that really quickly and see all the different buck pictures and locations based on the time of year. So that's like the highest level of, um, organization I do for trail camera stuff. I just save every buck picture, put them in these folders, have it divided by year. So there's the 2017 year property X property Y property Z. And then I have different folders then each year. Mm -hmm. But then if there's like a specific deer that I'm targeting, and this is something we've talked about in past episodes too, um, there are different tools that allow you to then study those pictures even further. So the one that I've used is deer lab. You can upload pictures of a specific buck. It pulls in the weather data, the time, all sorts of different things like that, applies that to each picture you have, and then you tag each one of those pictures with whatever bucket is. So I've got every picture of Holyfield in there from the past three years, and then it has all the associated weather, wind direction, barometric pressure, moon phase, time, uh, whatever it is, time of day, and then it starts giving you patterns. It can start visualizing with graphs and things like that, you know, how often he's moving with this wind direction or how often he moves the different moon phases or different things like that that allow you to just better understand the patterns and trends that you wouldn't otherwise if you were just looking at these pictures randomly. So, so I guess the point of all this I'm saying is that try to save these pictures in a way and study them in a way that you can use that information not just right now, not for just your hunt tomorrow, but for hunts next year and the year after that. Um, and that's that's how I've tried to do that. Yeah, it's a good point. I, you know, I think most of the tra the trail camera companies have software, you know, proprietary software yeah. that comes with the camera or whatever that you can utilize. It. Like Reconyx is his buck view. And I know Mark and, and Terry both use that. Um, I, I'm kind of similar set up to your system where I set folders – and at three, four years ago, it was different where I was, it was kind of random. And I, and when I go to go back and find those pictures of a certain deer, it's a nightmare. <laughs> so I, I learned the hard way, but, um, I think that's what those programs, like what you're talking about, kind of help yeah. assist you in figuring it out and making it a little bit easier. Cause you, you can meta tag them, you know, a certain sure. name or, or whatever. And, and it, and then it, it kind of automatically puts them into folders, but, um, I kind of do it the old school way of just making folders <laughs> yeah, on my, on my computer for, 
you know, a certain property. Uh, then it goes into locations. So North food plot, you know, South timber, whatever box blind. And, mm-hmm. and then from there it goes into the names of the deer. So if, if it's hook or pH or whatever, then from that folder, it's date driven. Sure. So, you know, it's very grain. It gets very granular. And, um, you know, if I ever need to use a buck view or, a, or, or like the program you talked about, I can then go in and, and hand pick those certain deer and those certain pictures and, and put them into the mm-hmm. program and, and, and try to figure out that triangulation and where they're going yeah. and coming. What always amazed me is, you know, guys like Mark and Terry, they just do it in their heads. They just figure it out like they study it and figure it out. Mm-hmm. It, it amazes me because I can't I'm just not good enough to do yeah, that i, I, I can't keep that. track of it i don't understand it that well you know yeah. what i mean like yeah. they can just visualize it that's what these guys do that's why they're so good but mm. they just visualize all of it by it. by studying the, the photos yeah so it's know. it's pretty amazing frankly uh tim would you add anything more on on that topic or just, or anything else i guess just the I think if deer knew how much effort we put into <laughs> pursuing they'd make them, it easier on us. <laughs> right. No kidding. I think they'd be extremely flattered. <laughs> what it shows me is I still suck at hunting. <laughs> <laughs> You're too hard on yourself, Matt. <laughs> Until I kill a deer on my own on that property, I'm I suck at hunting. That's why I'm sticking to it. It's gonna be it. a big day when you do that. <laughs> oh, it's gonna We're be gonna a party, celebrate. brother. <laughs> it's it's gonna happen this year. I, I got a good feeling. I've had a good feeling for two years now and it hasn't come through, so third time's the charm. Hopefully. Yeah, for both of us, right? <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, hopefully well, my hope, deer, hope, your deer, we can finally get them down. It's been a long time coming. Yeah, that's hopefully for sure. Joe gets a, a deer this year and can share his picture with us via social media yeah that'd be the icing on the cake man. Mm-hmm. yeah all because that of this podcast be. <laughs> i wouldn't say that <laughs> <laughs> he, he might have another question that he submits he's like all right you guys totally he tuned screwed out me up minutes ago, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah if anybody's still listening we appreciate <laughs> <Sorry>. it <laughs> <laughs> well i guess uh you know speaking of length of time we have been going pretty long here so maybe we should wrap it up and I know uh, Tim or Matt, you guys have some reminders as far as logistics. So I guess if you don't mind, I just want to use this to just say my farewell to this audience at least um, on the Drury YouTube channel watching this. I appreciate you guys letting me be a part of, uh, of this Drury collaboration we've had going on here. Um, it's been a lot of fun working with you, Matt, and Mark and Terry and everyone else on the team. I've learned a lot from everyone it's been uh, just a really cool partnership. So excited for what you guys are going to do in the future. Excited about ways that we can continue to try some new things together too. And um, everyone listening to this on the audio side, make sure you take what Matt and Tim are going to tell you next. Go and subscribe to the new version of the podcast because I know that there's going to be lots of great stuff coming down the line in the future too. So Matt or Tim, do you want to sign us off yeah I, I first of all i just appreciate i hate that attending i mean this is one of our longer podcasts I, i'd like to go another hour just to keep you a little longer <laughs> but i hate that attending man it's been such an honor and a pleasure to to be able to do this with you i i view you as as the top in our industry in this podcast world and so thank you very much and thank you thank to you. your audience that that you've brought to the table and and uh i really look forward to listening and tuning in to what you guys have going on in the future because i know it's going to be awesome so uh i appreciate it I just want to say that and then uh, on top of that you know Tim's going to get into where you can find all the the podcast info here in a second but before we get into that you know that we're getting ready to start airing all of our new TV shows. So uh, with that, we have a really new, exciting project that we're doing. Of course, Bo Madness is still out there Thursdays, 9 p.m. Central on the Outdoor Channel uh, 13. A new season of 13 is out there. Uh, and all this starts the week of the first week of July, uh, t- uh, Tuesday night, 9 p.m. Central for 13. But then we have a new project, a new TV show that's replacing Dream Season called uh, Critical Mass in, in conjunction with our partners at Moss Yo. And we're really, really excited about this. It's um, it's a totally different show. It's a totally different way of looking at a hunting show. It's yeah. when when Mark Drury and I kind of came up with the concept for it. I, I said this isn't you know just kind of I just kind of said it. I was like this isn't your daddy's hunting show. It just it isn't. It's different. It's fast paced. It's not a hunting show in the traditional sense. I hope that the viewers out there uh, give it a chance and take, take a, a look at it because it's, it's something I feel like it's a fresh breath of fresh air. Yeah, I hope it yeah. is. Um, but it's, we're trying to be fun. We're trying to uh, add an archery tag element into it. We're trying to just do something different. And in today's day and age, 
there's not much that hasn't been done as far as outdoor programming in a, in a predominant whitetail show. So we're trying something new. I hope the audience uh, can gravitate towards it. It's Tuesday night, 9.30 p.m. Central on the Outdoor Channel. And um, as the shows start airing, we kind of have two big things that we're doing this year, critical mass being one of them. And then inside the shows, you're going to see us start talking about a new app that we're getting ready to launch called DeerCast. And in the month of July, uh, you'll start hearing about it a little more. And then we're launching it August 28th uh, in the App Store. It's a free app. It, it'll be in Android and in the, in the uh, Apple, uh, Apple uh, App Store. So... Um, You'll, you'll hear more about it, I'm sure, in our upcoming podcast, but it's something that we've been working on for the last two years. We've stuck a lot of capital investment into it, a lot of time, a lot of effort, and it's kind of going to play off of um, the show 13. It's all in an effort to help aid guys like Joe at home, guys like me that need to know, hey, you know, what, what should I be looking at as far as the weather conditions go? Yeah. What what factors or conditions will help me um, know when they might move mm-hmm. instead of wasting my time and sitting out there on a 90 degree day and a low pressure day or whatever it is. Yeah. It, th- this takes all of Mark and Terry's combined 70 years of hunting knowledge and puts it into an app that ultimately helps make you a better hunter, which has been Drury Outdoors goal mm-hmm. since 19, 1989 yeah. is just to try to help our consumer, uh, not make the mistakes we've made and we've made a lot of them. So, <laughs> uh, you know, outside of that, it's going to be a better journal experience where you can see the kills as they happen during the fall. It's going to be an, uh, a media hub, all a DOD TV's content, this po- video version of the podcast, uh, a lot of original series, all kinds of cool stuff will be available on this app and it's free. There's no in-app purchases. There's no, I mean, it's just our thank you to our, mm-hmm. our viewers for sticking with us and hopefully it can help make people um, just hone their craft a little bit more. Yeah. It's, so yeah, it's an incredible app. That's uh, that's the only final push I wanted to have a critical mass and the new shows and, and then deer cast, the new app we're launching August uh, 28th. And then yeah. Tim, anything to add to that? Yeah. So, uh, so Mark, I would just say uh, anyone's success in the hunting industry is everyone's success. So I'm super excited for you and just a huge congratulations for what you've built and where it's going. That's uh, that's, that's awesome. We need that. Um, Thank you. Then secondly, if you want to continue listening to this show, it's ca- it'll be called Drury Outdoors 100% Wild Podcast. Find it on our website, dreoutdoors.com slash podcast. From there, you can click the Stitcher link or I- the iTunes, uh, uh, iTunes store or Google Play. You can still catch the show on YouTube so you can see what we look like when we're talking. <laughs> <laughs> the viewership you, just went down. Whether you want to or not, that's that, that's up to you. But there's there, there's lots of ways to get it. But if you want to continue getting the show, you do have to subscribe to the new show. Get our entire back catalog of, of the shows that you've hosted there, Mark, um, under now Drury Outdoors 100% Wild Podcast. So that's it from us, buddy. As always, you know, everybody can follow us on social media at Drury Outdoors. And uh, we just, again, I thank you for all the help you've given us, Mark. Hey, it's been my pleasure. It's been a blast. And to everyone out there listening and viewing, thanks for being here with us. Peace. See ya.